Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amanduri, and uh, we've been, we're very honored to have Charles Ortel on the line with us today. Uh, someone who just has a deep understanding and, and really digs into what is going on behind the curtain, not the surface level news that we get, but what is going on behind the scenes, whether it's geopolitics, economics, and as we all know, when it comes to politics, as much as we hate to uh, acknowledge this, it is tied to money. It's tied to where things are going as a country, as a people, and how countries might, end, might do. I mean, I think a lot of us can agree that we're headed toward a socialist, tyrannical uh, trend here in the U.S. I mean, in, in many ways, what we're seeing here in the U.S. is what we've seen in third world countries. And here we are today. So that has economic implications directly tied to politics. So we're going to be talking about that today. Uh, visit Charles Ortel's website, charlesortel.com. Charles, thanks for coming on the show with me today. It's a, my honor. Thanks for having me. Well, I'd love to just start here. You know, current news, uh, we've had 15 days to flatten the COVID curve, and it's still mainstream headlines. Delta variant lockdowns. It's uh, this is all that, you know, we're hearing nowadays. And we're seeing a, a constant narrative change with the vaccine. The vaccine was 95 percent effective. Now it's uh, maybe 60 percent. And it, it's not now it's not even meant to keep you from getting covid. It's for you to not be hospitalized. And so just a constant changing of the news on a regular basis. And we have the president issuing uh, and what I believe is unconstitutional orders to mandate vaccinations for anyone that's working for a company over 100 employees. And obviously that's trickling down into many more things. I mean, we're seeing what's going on with Los Angeles, with the bars and, and uh, Dodger Stadium chargers. Uh, this is not going away. And, and maybe you're OK with the vaccine. Maybe you're not. But it does set the precedence for tyranny. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so going back to the beginning, we, I was fortunate with my colleague, Jason Goodman. Uh, he runs something called Crowdsource the Truth. And we have been doing shows on this really since before the lockdown. We were one of the very few people here in New York to go around New York City twice a week, starting in late March 2020, and give people, viewers, a chance to see what New York City looks like. We've been all over to most of the boroughs, we, we live here in Manhattan, so we concentrate on Manhattan. This story was sold to us originally as it, this is much worse than the flu. It is much more dangerous than the flu. Um, and therefore we have to take extraordinary measures uh, on, the, on behalf of society to cooperate to uh, lessen the negative consequences of this supposed scourge. And instead of uh, lasting even 15 days, what this has really done is it's destroyed the traditional doctor-patient relationship. Mm. It has destroyed um, society, frankly. I mean, it has created, we do not yet know the uh, damages, which I think are incalculable, the emotional damages, the psychiatric damages, the generation uh, will change uh, negative consequences. Little kids, you know, the three, four, five-year-olds, they have spent most of their conscious existence in fear of this dread disease. And little kids worry about many things. Who knows how this is going to translate across their lives and impact society. And when we get into the hard facts, I mean, I'm not a medical person. In fact, I'm squeamish. I don't like doctors. And I don't like thinking about these issues. But the simplistic way in which I think about it is, um, if you tell me I have to take something, that's the debate. We can debate whether this is a vaccine. You tell me I have to put a needle in my arm. I want to know what the potential negative consequences of doing that are. And then I want to marry that up with an understanding of what are the potential negative consequences of getting infected. Then I also want to understand, and as it happened in my personal case, um, I had went through a long period of not traveling internationally after June 2012 when my ex-wife I was diagnosed with terminal cancer. So I was stuck here in the United States and I began uh, traveling again in uh, 2020, actually. Uh, sorry, 2019. Um, and I went uh, on a trip to the Bahamas, uh, sorry, to Bosnia in, in 
September of 2019, and then the Bahamas in November, December, then Norway in January. And each time I went, I got a cold afterwards, you know, and worse than normal cold. And in Norway in particular is a place where there's a lot of close association with the Chinese. And originally we were told that, you know, the first signs of this thing may have been January, February time, maybe December, 2019. Now we're learning that it's maybe before that. So we don't really know when this actually started. We therefore don't really know how many people like perhaps me got it and got through it and have natural antibodies. And we really don't know with precision what it is that each of these treatments, these experimental gene therapies, what they actually are what the negative consequences actually may be. There are stories today about the um, adverse reaction statistics being off by a factor of 10. That is to say that the adverse re uh, reactions may be 10 times the number reported. So the medical profession, and in particular, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks and others around them have sold this, this global jab program, which it, could be seen as a global enrichment to the manufacturer program uh, with, funded by taxpayer dollars as if it was a necessity and a low risk operation. And they stand revealed, I think the two of them as being utter fools, dangerous fools. Then you go back in my work on the Clinton Foundation, it gets praise from the people who don't like to do any homework under a theory that they had a central role to play the Clinton Foundation in bringing down the cost of HIV and AIDS medicine. That's the same approach that was taken with HIV and AIDS in the beginning by Dr. Fauci and Brooks and others, where it was early on in the 80s, 90s, uh, the original theory was that maybe HIV was especially prevalent among intravenous drug users and homosexuals, specifically homosexual men. And it was Fauci who, who and his team who said, no, 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 this could affect everybody and heightened concern over it did not address uh, the, the, uh, the original HIV and AIDS drugs. You can look into it. There are different formulations. They, they don't deal with AIDS. They deal with arresting the progression of HIV to become full-blown AIDS. And those original drugs, it has been shown, killed a lot of people. They were, mm. they were not organized properly. They, they were far more harmful than beneficial. And it was Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks who were involved in that project. So, and moreover, it, uh, it was Tedros at the World Health Organization who uh, experimented with the Clinton Foundation in Ethiopia, specifically channeling adulterated drugs. He may not have known they were adulterated at the time into Ethiopia beginning in August of 2004. These drugs likely came from an Indian drug manufacturing company called Ranbaxy that has been, took a long time to get them disciplined, but was severely disciplined in 2013 by our, our government and is in a mess of trouble ever since. So this exercise, to me, I, I really think back in the day when doctors were not necessarily profit-seeking people, the Hippocratic Oath was first do no harm. Very comfortable going to somebody who doesn't have a profit motive, sharing that with that person, my, pers my medical history, and then consulting with that person and others to figure out should I take this thing seriously or not? This particular affliction, what's the best treatment? What alternative treatments may, may, might there be? I don't care, frankly, what you or any other member of the audience thinks about what I should do with my own personal health. It's not none of your business. You know, it's, it's up to me to figure out, weigh up the risks and benefits. And we've moved off of that with this process into perfect strangers on the street could say, you're an idiot for not wearing a mask or why aren't you vaccinated or you can't go to a health club. I mean, it's, it, we've thrown the United States system of governance on its head uh, in thrall to the World Health Organization, which is corrupt as hell. Yeah. And the specific actors in it, especially Tedros, are people who should be in prison, not running the World Health Organization. Look into his record. Well, it's just interesting because there's, there's an interesting quote from Black Hawk Down. Um, let's see. I have it here. It's... Uh, once the first bullet goes past your head, politics and all that shit goes right out the window. And, uh, and it's, I find this to be true of COVID because so many people are so divided politically 
And there are people that I know, and I'm sure you do too, that got COVID and got it bad and were in the hospital and died from this virus. Now, we, it's hard because they're able to use this narrative of people dying and getting sick and, and to take away our freedoms. But at the same time, there, there's nuances to this. There is treatment to treat COVID. There's cures on the treatment side that are not being acknowledged. They're not being researched. Uh, and it's very unfortunate. I mean, I'm seeing this, you know, a friend of mine who's 33 years old, very healthy, uh, tried to get treated, tried to get, you know, uh, doctors that are having very good success with ivermectin and some of these other drugs. And because he was in California, CVS and Walgreens would not fill the prescription because that was for COVID. And it right. just blows me away that yes, okay, so we can't question the vaccine. There's YouTube channels getting shut down. Uh, you know, you're getting censored if you talk about stuff like this, while uh, they're, they're crapping all over treatments. I mean, look what they did to Joe Rogan and uh, CNN right. calling it horse pills that he took. And he's like, this is ridiculous. Like how, how surface level are you interpreting what I did and equating it to, to horse pills when people absolutely take ivermectin for different things. They've been taking it for years. And it's just, it's so unfortunate and we're seeing this. But in the end, when you're in that hospital room and you, your body got overwhelmed with COVID and you now have pneumonia and your heart is got, you know, it's spiking because it's, it's racing and, you know, you're not even moving, you're not even doing anything. You don't care at that point what the politics are. You just want to get better. But unfortunately, I believe the the doctors and the leaders in charge, in many ways, they're killing people. Well, so uh, I'll take a step back and say, in the first instance, what has been rushed through uh, and now is being administered around the world is not a vaccine, technically. It is a, an experimental gene therapy. And um, second point, is that I've seen, and who knows if they're reputable or not. I mean, Lancet studies, you've got to be very careful with them. If in the front portion of Lancet, they may or may not be serious. They may or may not be properly peer reviewed and who in fact influences the editorial content of, of these academic magazines, uh, you know, no one really knows. And what might the agendas be of the drug companies who want to get approval for their various medicines and have them injected around the world. So. I've seen studies nonetheless that suggest that if you just get COVID and get through it, your natural antibodies uh, are far more effective than any of these experimental treatments. So if you were gonna be, again, I'm a numbers person and an you know, investor, I'm not a doctor, I'm not giving medical advice or pretending to, but logically speaking, it seems to me the correct way to do this would be to test first to see if you've already had COVID. That, that should be one thing. And if you have, and you have the natural antibodies, it, it should not make sense to force such a person into getting this experimental treatment. That ought to be the first you know, door that you go through. Then if you're gonna say to somebody, you have to take this experimental therapy, you should be looking at the uh, history of, of, of use of this. And you should be looking at people by age cohort, by comorbidity, by sex, by uh, national origin, because sometimes these diseases uh, affect people di you know, differently. And, and really what we have in the United States of America, as Tucker Carlson was saying recently, and it's amazing the censorship on YouTube, but somehow Tucker is able to get right into these issues. Um, we have a health problem in this country, America. We have a lot of overweight people. We have a lot of people who don't exercise enough. We have a lot of people with other conditions that uh, in, in the end, and I'm familiar with some people who ultimately died not of COVID, but they had other comorbidities. And if you shift the incentive system in the hospitals to say, well, if this person had um, prostate cancer, heart problems, such and such, and also died with COVID, let's attribute the death to COVID and not say that there's two or three or four other conditions. That is shoddy analysis. It's dangerous analysis. It should, it's not the type of work that legitimate frontline doctors normally would do. And here I submit that one of the problems we have in America with our health system 
if you go back as I've done and you look at Yale Medical School and Harvard Medical School and Columbia Medical School and ask yourself, how many applicants do they have and how many people do they mint? You see that the number of doctors at these great schools has not risen to keep pace with the number of applicants. What has soared is the number of idiots like Chelsea Clinton who go through and get a master's in public health administration and a doctor of public health administration. The number of bureaucrats that these schools churn out, the number of lawyers that they churn out to, to work with the bureaucrats is overwhelming, I would argue, the research and frontline medical work that needs to be carried out in the United States. Instead of having doctors focus on that, they have to deal with the administration systems, the insurance problems, the legal risks, the insurance costs, and all this kind of stuff. That's an area that really needs to be addressed. And so I would say that the Dr. Fauci, uh, when I heard him say in the very beginning uh, that it was okay to go on a Tinder date in the beginning of uh, the COVID uh, shutdown, I mean, right there, he lost all credibility for me. I mean, that's a Tinder is, a, I believe, a pretty dangerous approach to start you know, getting close to somebody you don't even really know. There are all sorts of risks attendant to that. If it's okay to do that, you certainly don't have to lock down the global economy. Yeah. And so I hope that we actually go back over this ground. I'm encouraged to see, as I say, Tucker and others in the mainstream get through questioning some of the bedrock assumptions that were sold to us as truth back in March of 2020. And I hope we learn from this experience because the, the, these experts, as the chairman of a major bank once told me when I was doing takeover work, he looked at me and said, experts don't know diddly. And that's not always true, but oftentimes some experts get all puffed up and think that because they have a narrow expertise, they can opine on everything. And I think Fauci is one of those people. Yeah. Well, it's unfortunate. I mean, I just see what happened in California. The recall election was in favor uh, of Gavin Newsom. And then the day after L.A. County announces all these orders, they get back right back to being tyrants. And I feel like that's where things are headed uh, more and more. And, you know, the thing is, is even people who would otherwise be resistant to some sort of uh, major government overreach, a lot of these people have gotten the vaccine, which again, I'm not judging you. You know, I'm sure there's some truth to it. You know, you get the vaccine, there's a frontline defense. Maybe it's keeping people out of the hospital. I know a lot of people who've been exposed to COVID who've had the vaccine and didn't get it. But I also know a lot of people who had the vaccine and got COVID again. So, I mean, there's that as well, but you know, those people, I don't know anyone who's got the vaccine and got COVID bad. I mean, but I guess I, I have a small sample, but I've read about it and I've seen a lot of news on that. Anyways, my point is you have a situation where the majority of people have already gotten this thing that they're overreaching on. So it's it's very easy to apply it to the minority, minority of people that are left. And we've just gone so far down this tyrannical rabbit hole uh, with what happened in 2020 with the lockdowns. I mean, unprecedented lockdowns. Uh, you have the situation of, you know, government checks and dependence on the government. And, you know, you can't go to work, you can't earn a living, but the government is going to take care of you. I mean, this is what we're seeing. And now, you know, they're get away, getting away with not letting you go to a sporting event, not letting you travel, not letting you work, not letting you earn income unless you comply and even the president was up there saying, you know, his patience is wearing thin with those that are left. And I'm just, I don't even know what that means. You know, that sounds like a threat in many ways, which I think it was. Um, you were referring to the, the president or the resident? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, exactly. Well, on this subject, you know, it, focusing on economics a little bit and, and whether or not we've had true economic progress, um, clearly in the war on terror, we've had no progress, right? I mean, we, we, we spent who knows how many trillions of dollars in lives and wounded and emotionally hurt um, since September 11th, 2001. And we're basically persona non grata in, uh, in Iraq, who's cozied, cozied up to Iran, rushing to create nuclear weapons. And uh, of course, we, we, don't, we won't be going back into all Afghanistan anytime soon. So in, in, as far as the war on terror is concerned, I think we have to, it's not that we lost it, but we certainly squandered a tremendous amount of treasure 
pursuing it the way we pursued it. You have to ask yourself as well, are we better off economically in 2021 than we were before the advent of broadband internet? When prior to the advent of broadband internet, people didn't really spend their days glued to their phones and their screens. And people really didn't, uh, prior to Facebook and Twitter and others, enter all kinds of confidential information for free into a global system that could be then mined for the benefit of Silicon Valley and other, other investors. So we have a situation now where if you want to actually, once we get back to normal, uh, keep your job or build a business or whatever, you have to work 24 seven. And you can talk about these why, you know, big salaries that you get in investment banking or hedge funds or whatever. But if you look at it on a per hour basis, really factoring in how much time you're spending at home and elsewhere working for these salaries and, and bonuses, you're not, in my view, better off uh, turning, looking at dollars 2021 value versus dollars, let's say 1989 value. Uh, you, you're not much better off, but what you have surrendered is a tremendous amount of your freedom. And, uh, and you're, you, you've got reduced flexibility. That's before you consider the fact that anybody who works in the private sector is more easily replaced now, either engineered out of the equation or by AI, artificial intelligence, or by other or by cheap labor in other countries. So we have a situation where the frankly idiots, the economically illiterate people who run the apparatus at various national and international operations, have solved the problem by pressing down interest rates, benchmark interest rates onto the floor, and creating a lot of debt, which instead of being invested productively has been wasted. And so we have a towering pile of debt globally, 300 trillion or more. And we have, you can't look at gross domestic product that's a very bad number. When you, when you look at its origins, Simon Kuznets in 1934, his letter to the Senate Finance Committee explaining the pluses and minuses of the predecessor gross national product. This is a number that over, overstates true economic activity. It accords too much. It double counts the contribution of salaries from government workers. And there are other major league flaws in it, which leads it to overestimate how much economic activity there is. I think the simpler way to look at it is to focus on consumption. And you know that's what the people, the 85% of Americans who don't save any money and are just living off their paychecks or trying to, that's a better measure of the output in my that plus the value of capital investment year, year by year, not stock market investment, but putting up factories and buildings and other stuff and things like that, economically useful assets. If you look at the relationship of debt in the United States of America to the sum of consumption and investment, you see a very dangerous position for the US and for the world which we've been staving off reckoning, creative destruction caused by, you're seeing it now, Evergrande in China, maybe, where people who unwisely and foolishly lent too much money to suspect activities are gonna lose their money. Mm. And where that game of musical chairs ends and whether we'll be able to sit down when it does end is a big question. But I don't think we have made substantial economic progress in the uh, post-1989 period because I think the, the academics and the thought leaders and the pundits embraced unregulated globalism without thinking through its perils. We now have very long supply chains. We see how that's creating problems with uh, China's shipping issues. Uh, we have too much production, essential production concentrated outside our shores where we can't control it. We don't know the quality of it really. And what we should have done instead of what we did do was to promote the production of goods and services from within the United States. We should have um, encouraged exports of same. We should certainly not have allowed transfer of essential vital technology to rivals, frankly, enemies, China and elsewhere, uh, so long as those countries were run by the People's Liberation Army in the case of China and the, and the Communist Party. We should have just said, look, we don't care about the growth or, or, or financing growth into of communism in China in a nation four times the size and population as our own, you know, we're just not gonna do that. If the Germans wanna do that, let them do it, but we're not doing it. And we're not, certainly not gonna uh, let them pretend to be a developing country and not subject to the same rules we're subject to uh, for this long. We're certainly not gonna allow 
their academics, supposedly academics, when in fact they're probably spies, to live inside our universities and who knows what they do in their free time. We're just not gonna do any of that. And instead, Dianne Feinstein employed a spy for a long time. Uh, who knows how many others inside the power elite in the United States are enthralled to China. We don't even need to bring up Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and the Chinese fund and all that stuff. So we're in a moment here where um, the people who are directing the economy, Joe Biden, who, you know, I should say what's left of Joe Biden and others, uh, should not be allowed anywhere near an economic decision, whether it's AOC or the Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or Nancy Pelosi, or these people who live lives of privilege, protected by their bodyguards, insulated from daily concerns. You know, and what they're doing is they're making a market in the misery of others. They're, mm. they're letting you know that they can make your life miserable and you better pay them off or they're going to punish you even harder. That's no way to run a country. And just as you don't say to somebody who is 25, um, yeah, you can get in a car and drive it wherever you want with no license and no insurance. Politicians who have such power now to uh, burn money and pile on debt in this country should be forced to prove that they understand basic economics before they have anything to say about these policies. And Joe Biden is the man, I won't go into his long history, but he is the person who supervised the burning of $800 billion in Obama stimulus. He was the one who got up there with that idiot Jeff Immelt of GE and said, this is different. We have a whole bunch of shovel ready jobs. So they coaxed the money out under false pretenses Come the time to talk about what actually happened to the money, and they laugh. They're on tape. You can see it. They're laughing about the fact that, they, well, I guess there weren't any shovel-ready jobs. That's not funny. And in the real world, in the, in the private sector real world where I live, you don't get away with that. If you burn $800 billion, you never work again. No. And that, I think, there, there needs to be – I'm not talking about – I'm, talk, I'm not talking about any kind of physical reckoning, but there needs needs to be a reckoning, a true reckoning at the ballot box. We need to understand what really happened. I'm hearing reports out of California that there are some large hundreds of thousands of votes that disappeared, calling for a Newsom's recall mysteriously. I think whether you're a Democrat, progressive, independent, conservative, whatever, you need to have total confidence that your vote really will count, that legal votes will count. And watching this messing about, dare I say, going back before, I mean, Hillary Clinton is fond of saying 16 was rigged. So let's say we agree with her. Let's say that, you know, maybe there was an effort to rig that. It was probably led by Mark Elias and Hillary Clinton and the Clinton campaign. And they were probably shocked that their efforts didn't culminate in her winning. But there are there questions about the 2012 election? I think the 2008 election was very clearly not rigged. You know, there, I do think the better candidate won. I, I'm not an Obama fan, but I think McCain was such a disaster that there was no real prayer he was actually going to win. But we need to have confidence that these elections are actually free, full, and fair. And I certainly don't, based on the evidence that I see. Beyond that, I would hope that in the 22 and 24 elections that real pressure is put on candidates to explain with specificity what they're gonna to do to try to fix this great country. Because we're very close to imploding here. We've got too much debt, we're woefully mismanaged. We have, and Mark Milley, I think we have a traitor from what we see so far as currently serving as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And as recently as several hours ago, Joe Biden uh, said that he has complete confidence in Mark Milley. Of course, he also said that Hunter Biden was the smartest person he knew. So that, what does that say? Yeah. Uh, well, Charles, it's an interesting thing. We live in a situation where the oppressed support the oppressor. And it's more and more to that uh, degree. You know, you got the money printing happening, which seems to be uh, where the, the most of the control is. And, you know, if you're closest to that spigot, you're the banks. And then, you know, next might be the governments and then rich people. And, you know, so, uh, and then the, all of this whole system is, is strung along with surface level 
virtue signaling, you know, benefits for workers and benefits for, uh, you know, racism and, and all of these different things that are so surface level. And then the instant gratification of that benefit to the, the larger and larger middle class that starts to get dependent on the government. And that's what we're facing. And it's an imploding system. I totally agree with that because I don't see that reversing. It's, it's, uh, I don't see people deferring their immediate gratification for the greater good of the country that they're more disconnected from. They're more connected to an instant check than, hey, we're going to uh, defer our gratif instant gratification of those checks so we don't have to go into greater debt as a country so that we can be more prosperous as a whole and you know we can start businesses, our kids will be able to thrive. Uh, and and I, I, we're just not set up for that. It's, and we've lost where our, our growth was founded on, the fertility of, of that free market capitalistic environment. And we're, we're so far from that. And so I'll let you respond to that. Maybe share some closing thoughts, but yeah, please feel free to respond to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I've noticed, I started out my life, though, I spent time participating in charities, fundamentally focused in the private sector in the US and internationally. In the US, a recent study claims, I don't know if it's right or wrong, that in some recent period, the average net profit margin of an American business is 7.7%. So that means across the entire economy, you know, you look at your own business, if you're, if you're pulling down after taxes, more than 7.7% of revenue, you're in good shape. I mean, you're in better shape. Now, that tells me that the business world is very competitive. And that's, if you think about, uh, you, you don't have to set up a business, but there are quite a few um, investments that you could make where you're not working and you're not thinking and you're not taking orders and you're not wasting your time where you can get two, three, four, or 5% return, maybe not after tax, but on these, and depending on your income level, that, that's a, a very substantial return without taking the risk of, of shepherding a collection of people who are tough to manage day to day, 365 days a week, 24 hours a day. That's a thin margin in my view. Now you go over to the global grift business where like AOC, you say, you know, America needs to spend $93 trillion to arrest climate change. It's an mm. absurd notion, the $93 trillion. She's just, she's not AOC and I won't tell you what it stands for, but she's FOS. And that unfortunately, this global grift game, starting with the HIV AIDS experiment in 2001 to get the uh, Global Fund put together as this gigantic pot of money. Now we're in another phase of it with COVID in the trillions. You assert you have this gigantic problem that needs immediate flows of money. You get involved with that, with, the, um, with any natural disaster, which are recurring. And we're not gonna stop earthquakes. We're not gonna stop hurricanes. And forget about trying to do that. They're going to come. You just have to be prepared and hope that you have vehicles ready to help those who've been damaged. And you also have to start encouraging people who live in hurricane or earthquake prone areas to consider moving. I mean, here we have in New Orleans, yet another disaster following the one in 2005. Maybe you should think twice about living in New Orleans. Uh, but anyway, um, in the global grift game, the big part, the first part of it is how much money did the charity or the effort actually raise? And there's not enough control over that because a lot of the money comes in over the internet and is not traceable. So we're not easily traceable. So the, the first grift is that you don't know the revenues, the total revenues of the business. I believe in certain cases, people may be taking 90% of the money off the top. You know, vast sums going. If you look at these GoFundMe projects, projects that don't really merit tremendous amounts of money, in my view, get a couple hundred, three hundred thousand dollars on GoFundMe when they should get five or ten. So projects that do have merit, like fixing Haiti or uh, the tsunami in 2004, we really don't know how much money came in there. And, and in the case of Haiti and Clinton, he refused, the, the Haitians and Clinton refused to account for how much money really came in and where did it go? The next level of that grift is you can say, let's say you actually raised a billion you say you got 100 million, and then you claim you gave 60 million of it away, but you get some friendly charities to say, donors to say, okay, I just need a report from you saying that I gave you a million dollars and I'll give you $100,000 and 
and you know for doing nothing and we'll and I'll give you another hundred thousand for playing along and I'll steal eight hundred thousand for myself there are no real checks you know, the IRS is not set up or willing to do the kind of cross-checking I've done so I would submit to you that in the charity world the average return and there shouldn't be any return to people around the charity is way in excess of 7.7%. It could be 40%. It could be 200% if you believe that you're really crooked people out there stealing off the top or even more. And that's an area that really urgently needs to be reformed. So much of the thought shaping around the world is through charities. Many of the news organizations are, are technically charities. The university systems around the world are mo mostly charities. And instead of educating, allowing our younger people to become actually educated and thoughtful and critical thinkers, instead they're becoming wokeized and so they're promoting a whole bunch of propaganda, which technically makes these entities not charities lawfully. So that whole sphere, instead of sending boatloads of money to the IRS to attack private sector workers, what we should be doing is looking at charity land aggressively, starting with the Clinton Foundation, the Gates Foundation, other foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation, other foundations that have been shaping and selling this preposterous, unregulated globalism theory for the benefit of the, the, the supposed power elite and those who will play along. That's an area where if we address that aggressively, we bring in a lot of money, we change behavior, and we probably come back together as a, as a nation because in this country, Charity land is actually populated without regard to, to, to politics. I mean, there are many areas of charity land you find conservatives and progressives working together for the common good. So that's an area I'd like to see reform aggressively. I think we need to have, before we spend another penny on any international project, we should be thinking how we can help, if we have extra money, the inner cities across this country, Appalachia, economically depressed parts of this country, we should be protecting our borders. We should be promoting productive activities. And we should encourage people to, instead of thinking about global problems, they should be thinking about themselves, their families, their communities, if they want to go further than that, their state, their country, not trying to rush around the world into countries that have very damaged infrastructures or none at all. Uh, thinking that you can impose a solution that works in Geneva, Switzerland, on a country like the De Democratic Republic of the Congo that has no roads, no electricity, no hospitals to speak of, no doctors, no nurses, no clean water, uh, no sanitation. I mean, it, it takes a huge investment in a country as big as that one is to, to hope that you can have a global solution work inside that country. And so we need, uh, we need a radical shift, I think, away from the nonsense that has been promoted out of Washington, D.C. and New York City for so long. Well, there you have it, everyone. Charles Ortel, charlesortel.com. Charles, thank you so much for coming on the show with me today. Uh, powerful interview. Uh, I'm looking forward to posting this and uh, just getting some of the reactions. I mean, I think we hit some pretty uh, pretty hard-hitting topics, and your articulation of it was uh, was spot on. And, and I think it, it's going to connect the dots for a lot of people because – it's confusing to look at this whole thing and try to make sense of it. The, the guilt, the what people should have, the virtue signaling. I mean, this whole thing together, it's very confusing and very manipulative, but uh, we see it happening. So thanks again for coming on the show and sharing your thoughts. Thank you for having me.